All right, we are going to pray and then we will get into our study. Lord Jesus, again, as we open up your word, we recognize that your word contains two great words, law and gospel. And Lord, as difficult it is, as it is to confess, we must hear your law and we must not mute it so that our sins may be rightly identified, so that we may confess them and that we may pray that you would give us strength of the Holy Spirit to help mortify our sinful flesh so that we may bear the fruit of the Spirit rather than the fruit of our flesh. We ask that in our study today that that would be the end to which your word works. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have been doing an excursus. We're, we've, we started a study of the book of James because we noted in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 18, it has words that if you don't get your categories right, it's easy to end up doing damage to your faith by not making that proper distinction between law and gospel. And we noted last week that there is no such creature as a Christian who doesn't do good works. I mean, I think unicorns might actually exist before something like that exists, okay? That is not a thing. That is, that is just not how this works. But our, you'll note then that you're not saved by your works, you are saved unto good works. So where a lot, so many people get things wrong is based upon what is called the opinio legis. That's the opinion of the law that's written in our hearts, where we are constantly steering towards the legalism ditch. You ever have a car that's out of alignment in, in you know, you let, you're out on a straight road and you let go of the steering wheel, and where does it want to go? Right into the ditch. And so it, either on the right side or the left side, it just depends on how it's unaligned. But the idea then is, is that each and every one of us, because we have the law written on our hearts, which is a good thing, we have a tendency to steer towards legalism. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that we have to worry about, because we also have to worry about antinomianism, this hatred of God's law and the belief that I'm so free in Christ, I can just live like a heathen pagan and God loves me anyway. Now, that's not exactly how this works. But uh, I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. So within the, uh, the postmodern emergent churches, they were, uh, they were avid followers of a guy by the name of Jürgen Moltmann. Okay, if you've never read any theological book by Jürgen Moltmann, you are blessed. If you have ever read anything by Jürgen Moltmann, then uh, you know that he single-handedly cured insomnia. So, you know, his books are just, just long drawn out tomes of nonsense but uh, thankfully there was a, a woman with the last name of Schroyer who in the emergent church movement decided to uh, take Jürgen Moltmann's bizarre liberalizing postmodern theology and write it rewrite it in a way that is understandable and so in the in the liberal in the liberal postmodern churches they have this idea that um, that when the Bible was written, it really reflects human opinions about God, not how God really is. So, the, so when you look in the Old Testament and you hear that God has cast judgment on a particular people group and has decided that they are going to be wholly devoted to destruction as a way of God judging them for their sins, People today sit there and go, well, that wasn't really God doing that. That was just their opinions about God, which weren't fully developed. And so their, their, their organizing principle is this idea, that, that God has uh, within his core a central core of love, love between the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what God has been doing is expanding his concentric circles of love to surround more and more and more people. So it's kind of, you ever take a big rock and throw it into a calm pond or a lake or something like that? It goes kerplunk, right? And then you got these circles that just kind of emanate out. And so in their, in their theology, then the, the idea here is, is that God doesn't, doesn't exclude anybody. And what happens is, is that through human history, God's ever expanding concentric circles of love are now reaching people that have been ostracized by religious people but now God says, no, you're in. So, you know, it doesn't matter what, you know, what your particular sin is. Don't worry. God's concentric circles of love have now embraced you and you're in too. Yeah, that's right. It's a form of universalism. So, right. 
There's no such thing as universalism with evidence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, their ideas, their, their ideas do not have evidence. Right. You're right, because that's not, a, that's not a, what the, the Bible teaches at all. How do they reconcile the fact that Christ on the day of judgment say, depart from me, I never knew you to people, right? Was it that Christ's concentric circles of love failed to reach them? I mean, what, what on earth are we supposed to be talking about here? But you're going to know that's not how this works. So the two ditches that we are avoiding, we are avoiding legalism, which ultimately is a denial of the gospel. We're denying antinomianism, which is a, is a twisting of the gospel and a denial that God's law has any kind of bearing on our lives. So as Christians, then, how do we work then with law and gospel? Answer, we keep them in tension, okay? Uh, they each serve a function in what God sent them to do. The law is there to make us understand that we have sin and to show us what a good work is. The gospel is given to comfort us and to assure us that we have forgiveness, mercy, and grace in Christ by his merits alone, not yours added to it or mine added to it. So coming back then, you'll note Exodus not Exodus, Ezekiel 18 talks about the, 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 the righteous person who doesn't continue in his righteousness, no longer being righteous and things like that. But before we get into it, I want to finish the book of James. And here's where I'm going to kind of go, sit a little bit on a high horse or my soapbox. And that is, is that uh, many Lutherans, I've mentioned this before, have a mostly hate-hate relationship with the, with the epistle of James. And this is not a correct thing. Um, this is scripture. The, the, the church has always recognized it as scripture, and even Luther ultimately recognizes it as scripture. And this is law that we need to hear. I would note that James picks up on themes that are very vital for the church and the health of the church, especially local congregations, that to neglect these, this text leaves you open to sins that legitimately can come in and wreck an entire congregation because you don't know what you're looking for because James puts his finger on it and speaks of it in such a way that you can easily identify where things are going wrong. So note James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with, with greater strictness. Okay? Um, Again, I am um, terrified of men who have a lot of ambition, who the thing that the only thing that they have ever, have ever wanted to do is to be a pastor. And boy, they can't wait to be a pastor. And they love the trappings of the pastor. They love the vestments of a pastor. They love the idea of people shaking their hands at the, back of the ser- at the back of the church. And they want people to call them pastor. You must call me this, right? That is a, mmm, that's a red flag, right? They dress themselves as the most lavish. Right, okay. Um, I, 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 am, I have a high love and value of pastors who are second career guys, who have been not only graduates of a seminary, but graduates uh, in, in like graduate work in the School of Hard Knocks. Okay, if you have a, a PhD in the, from the School of Hard Knocks, that's a good guy to have as a pastor. All right, I love those guys who've been beaten down hard by life and they've been drugged into the pastorate. It's like, you know, you know that, that's a better thing, right? For we all stumble in many ways, James says, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. So look at the ships also. Though they are so large, they are driven by strong winds, and they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. <clears throat> and here's the thing. There isn't a single one of us who can look at this text and go, oh, darn it, that's describing me. 
to some extent. I, we're all guilty of this to one degree or another. And that's the point of the law. So how great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. I would note that over and again, I have seen many a pastor demonstrate who they really are, what they really believe, and show that they are really not servants of God just by the words spoken by their mouth. You know, when a pastor gets up and says, I think we need to rethink this whole idea of the doctrine of hell. This just doesn't seem right. I sit there and go, well, sir, you have just lit a fire from the fires of hell and you lit it with your tongue, right? This is how this goes. So uh, be, beware of the fellow, who, beware of being the, the fellow who ends up being judged because of the things that he approves of, right? Pay attention to what people are saying. So every kind of beast and bird of the, and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Uh-huh. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And so you note here, this is a call to repentance because this is a call for church people to come note here. You come to church, you sing the hymns, you pray the prayers, you praise God, and then you go home and you legitimately open your mouth and you curse people, members of your own family, your co-workers, and things like this, right? This is, this is not right. This is absolutely sinful. And James is the guy who puts his finger on it and says, this has got to stop. You need to repent. So no message of repentance to a group of people he's writing to who don't believe that they need to show any good works. And what is he doing? He's pointing right to their fruit, starting with their mouth. So who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. What a wonderful phrase. <laughs> In the meekness of wisdom. Have you noticed that the wise are not ambitious? The wise are quietly doing their business. They're doing their work. And there is a meekness to wisdom, but don't ever mistake meekness for weakness. Christ was meek, but he wasn't weak. And so you'll note that the... Meek do not insist on their own way. That they, there's a wisdom to how that they, they live, but that, is, that, that doesn't mean that they're not strong. So if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. There it is, selfish ambition and jealousy. Good grief, right? Um, one of the things I've seen many times is that those who, for whatever weird reason, have received a large platform, you know, the, the so-called Christian influencers and stuff like this, holy smokes, so many of those folks, they have striven for those things. Striven for. The only thing they care about in life is how many followers do they have? How many, you know, have they hit, the, have, they, have they got the platinum play button yet on YouTube and stuff like this? And when they get to it, oh my goodness, you'd think that they had, they had achieved something great on planet Earth. They, they have somehow scaled Mount Everest and did so in a speedo. You know, it, it, it's just crazy things like this. Yeah, that's right, Catherine Crook. Um, <clears throat> but beware of the ambitious. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who has a large platform is ambitious. I would note that um, I have a fairly large platform, but I consider the large platform to be a nuisance. Okay, 
it's a, it's a necessary evil, but it's not something I strive after. It's something that just is grown organically to the place that it is over decades of hard work trying to warn the church and warn the body of Christ. But the person who wants a platform, who wants and desires so badly to get out there and get in front of everybody so the spotlight can be on that person, that person is not somebody you want to listen to. That is not somebody you want teaching you the Scriptures. Beware of the selfishly ambitious. Ambition is a red flag. And note here, James is describing ambition in a way that those who are that way, that they live in a way that's false to the truth, not in accordance with the truth. I think of Ravi Zacharias. Okay? Ravi Zacharias was a fellow who was brilliant, but uh, he was also living a double life. But Ravi Zacharias made intentional decisions designed for the purpose of expanding his reach and improving his financial positions and stuff like this and making it so that his, his apologetic works were able to tap into different markets. So much so that Ravi Zacharias, he, what, well, he partnered with Joyce Meyer. And at the time, I pointed that out and said, this man shouldn't be partnering with Joyce Meyer at all. This woman is a word of faith heretic. She is a deceiver and somebody who the scriptures said that we are not to have anything to do with. We are to mark and avoid somebody like her. But Ravi Zacharias partnered with her. And when, the, when a lot, when, when the kind of the fever pitch uh, backlash of his partnering with Joyce Meyer hit its crescendo, he lashed out against the people who said that he shouldn't be working with Joyce Meyer and basically said, I hate heresy hunters. Do you now? Okay. Hmm. Paul told us to be that, but that's a different story. So you, you can tell a person, and then you'll, you'll note then, his decisions were not based upon the truth of Scripture. The warnings of the Bible to mark and avoid the false teacher, to not partner with them, to not have anything to do with them, to not participate in their dark deeds. He didn't care about sound doctrine. What did he care about? Himself. And then after his death, it came out that he was engaging in all kinds of pretty strange sexual things, right? So, does that, it, did it surprise me? No, it actually made a lot of sense. It tells me who Ravi Zacharias was really living for, Ravi Zacharias. So, beware of the selfishly ambitious. They do live contrary to the truth. And then James says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, it is unspiritual, and look, watch the next word. It's demonic. Do you know who else was really selfishly ambitious? Satan. That's, that's recorded for us in the scriptures. And I'm really looking forward to the part when we get to the book of Ezekiel where we get a little bit more of the backstory of Satan. We're not quite there yet, but Isaiah gives us you know, quite the rip-roaring uh, description of Satan. Isaiah chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. When you sound just like that, it's evident in your words, it's evident in your actions, and it's an, it, it, you have to be like blind to not see it. Welcome to every political campaign. Right, okay. Um, there was a day when you had to be nominated for, to be considered on a ballot for a political office. You had to be nominated. Some, a group of people had to come together and say, yeah, we really want you. And, and there were times in human history when people, they were chosen for their roles. They didn't seek them. The role and the office sought them. But we live in a world where it's all about the selfish ambition, the ambitious ones. These are our politicians and stuff. Okay? And we in America, we consider the ambitious to be blessed. 
we consider them to be role models. I mean, over and again, how many times have you heard the story about some kid who grew up in a difficult circumstance, maybe grew up in poverty or whatever, but he knew that he was going to be somebody great, so he, he packed his bags and he went to Hollywood, and wouldn't you know it, he showed up in Hollywood, 20 bucks in his pocket, and now he's a multi-billion dollar actor. What does he do for a living? He pretends to be somebody else. And we go, oh, he's the best thing ever. Most talented. Most, we, I want to be just like him. Why? Why do you want to be a person who isn't even their own person? The only time you see the real person is when they show up promoting the movie where they're pretending to be another person. And we say they're the ones who are blessed. How do we know they're blessed? Because they're so successful. Of course they're blessed. And then we then... Translate that to the church. The pastors who have the biggest churches, have the biggest platforms, who are able to have the biggest reach, they're truly blessed, and that's the thing that God is doing. Have you listened to their messages? Jesus doesn't even make cameo appearances anymore in those congregations. They hogtied him and threw him in a refrigerator. Okay, He's sitting there shivering. They pull him out maybe once a year, say hi to everybody, Jesus. And then they throw him back in the freezer. Okay? But they sit there and go, wow, they have, they have the blessing of God. No, they don't because they are behaving, their pastors are behaving in a way that is truly satanic. It is demonic. They are in it for themselves. So, you know, but what do I know? I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm just a jealous guy who serves this tiny little congregation in the middle of the sugar beet fields of Oslo, Minnesota. That's how the story goes about me, by the way. The, the reason why I'm critiquing all of these successful pastors is because I'm so jealous. <clears throat> right. Okay. So back to James 3. Okay. Mm -mm, hang on a second here. So this is not, selfish ambition is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It is earthly, it is unspiritual, it is demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be what? Disorder. And every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure. It is then peaceable. Gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Note where the, selfish ambitious, the selfishly ambitious and the jealous exist, there is disorder. And here's the thing. It doesn't, this disorder doesn't only come in the form of uh, pastors. This also happens in the congregation of people jockeying for positions of perceived power or influence within the actual congregation itself. I've seen this play out in church politics, and it gets really ugly, Right? And so you'll note then, this, nobody who is selfishly ambitious should have any position of power within the church because all of the offices within the church are serving offices, not ruling offices. All right? And I love the fact that there is a uniform that I wear that visually reminds you of where I stand in the congregation. You want to know where I stand? At the bottom. That's where all the freedom is, by the way. Listen to, listen to what I'm going to say here. There is total freedom at the bottom of the pack, in the bottom of the heap. Because as the servant of the congregation, I don't have to protect my job. Because nobody wants to be a servant. Okay? And just kind of work with me here. At the bottom, I have perfect freedom to serve everybody as long as they want to be served by me. If somebody doesn't want to be served by me, that's their, that's their business, not mine. I don't have to serve you. But you're going to note him here is that I don't have to worry about a coup d'etat. Roseboro, we're going to take you out of office. We're going to put somebody else in place because you know, we, we, we want to take all that power and that influence that you have and we want to take it for ourselves. I don't have any. I'm a slave. And that's the best place to be. In fact, 
I would remind you of the words written in Philippians chapter 2. And you're going to note Paul and James are teaching the same thing. They're just saying it differently. James is a little more blunt and in your face because he's going after the antinomians. So Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition, Philippians chapter 2. How many things are we supposed to do from selfish ambition? Nothing. Or from conceit. And this word, by the way, um, kenodoxia, that could also be like vainglorious conceit. Okay? And that's the thing. The ambitious are always vainglorious, right? Do nothing from selfish ambition or vainglorious conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. But if I do that, when are people going to recognize all the special gift that God has given me? (laughs) You condemn yourself with your words when you talk like that, right? Do nothing from selfish ambition or vainglorious conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. What a great church that would be, where everybody considered everybody else as more significant than yourself. No, really, I, I'm, I, you are so much greater than I am. No, no, really, you're greater than I am. Oh, come on, stop it. You know, and, you know, and so what are we trying to do in a, in a situation like that? Outdo each other in showing honor and love and mercy and grace and kindness. And we work hard without the expectation that somehow I need an attaboy from everybody in the congregation recognizing how hard I've been working, right? When are they going to recognize that I've been contributing the flowers for the altar for all this time and nobody has ever said thank you to me? (laughs) Right? Right? So let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also look to the interests of others. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. We look out for each other. We look out for each other's interests. When we are made aware of somebody's need in the congregation, we make sure that need is met, and we enlist as much help as possible, helping making sure that the people in our congregation are getting that help, right? And you'll note, because this is law, this still convicts us, but it shows us what good works are. So the wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason. Listen, brother, this is not right, right? And they go, hmm, you know, what you're saying is true. Full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, sincere, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And then we get to the next part of it. This, I think for a while this was like Don Matheson's favorite text. I, this one came up so often at times. But it, it absolutely needed to be brought up when he brought it up. So he says, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? What is it? What is it that causes you know, discord within the church? And I'm not talking about the server. I'm talking about actual discord, right? What causes discord? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Yes, they are. You desire, you don't have, so you murder. What a great solution, okay? I want that, I can't have that, so I kill you, (laughs) right? And if I don't want to actually kill you, kill you, I'll just destroy your reputation and murder you with my words by slandering you, right? You covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel, you do not have, because you do not ask. Now this, of course, gets into the, what is prayer. You'll note among the selfishly ambitious, those who've created a theology that goes with that selfish ambition, is the belief that somehow we as Christians possess power from God so that we can speak things into existence just like God did. And so they don't pray. They don't ask God for nothing. You know what they do? They decree and they declare and they command with their words. And so if somebody comes in their congregation, comes down with cancer, and they say, brothers, I need you to pray for me. I've been diagnosed with cancer, but I refuse to to believe that I have it, but I need you to pray for me. And so we're going to pray for you, brother. And so what do they do? Cancer, we command you in the name of Jesus to come out of Brother Joe here. You get out of his body right now. Right? Have they asked God for anything? No. 
So you'll note that there's a theology of prayer that goes with selfish ambition nowadays. And that theology of prayer teaches you to not ask God for anything. But instead, exercise your God-given authority as a child of God to command and control and decree and declare. And because, after all, aren't you children of the king? And it's like... <laughs> I would note this. Uh, let, let me ask you this. Uh, we Americans don't do royalty very well because we, we got rid of the king. You know, that, that was a while ago, and we haven't had one since. But um, in, in places where they have royalty, think of the United Kingdom. Right? Current reigning monarch of the, of the United Kingdom is King Charles, right? Okay. His son, Prince William, is Prince William able to make royal decrees and declarations and laws and things like this? Because after all, he's the prince, the crown prince of the United Kingdom. Is he able to do that? No. Okay. He ain't in power yet. Okay. Just because I am a son of God, and I am by adoption, and by the way, I can look at all of you and say, you know what, you're adopted. Okay, so am I, right? Do you think that as, by virtue of our adoption, we have authority to command things that only God has the authority to command? No, not at all. So the humble, those who are sane by virtue of the Holy Spirit, bringing us to repentance and faith in Christ, here, James says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So this kind of anticipates the next thing. Fine, I'll ask. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? And God goes, no. You told me to ask. Huh. Right. What do you need a Mercedes Benz for? Because I want everybody to know how successful I am. Really? Why do we need to telegraph that to everybody? When I worked at, uh, at uh, Rainier Bank, this was back in the day when Rainier Bank was a thing in the Pacific Northwest, we had a guy who would come up to the drive-up teller and make pretty substantial deposits very regularly. And he was driving an old, beat-up, red Datsun pickup truck. Do you guys remember these things? I mean, I think it was like four cylinders because it sounded like he had like a Kawasaki motorcycle engine inside of that thing. He'd read, read, come up, and he'd, pull, and he'd make deposits and stuff like this. But we had a new teller, and, um, and she would transfer from another bank, and they made her our head teller. But she didn't have any rapport with our customers. And this guy came into the bank one day and they had a disagreement because our new head teller, who had transferred from another bank, didn't recognize who this guy was and you know, what was going on. And so she kind of talked back to him a little bit. And he was requesting something and she said, no. And he said, why are you treating me this way? And she said, that's it, I'm gonna close my account. And so, um, the manager called over to begin the process of closing out his account, and when he was done, there was a cashier's check written in over a million bucks so that he can close out his account. That lady who was our head teller, she wasn't our head teller for much longer. The reason being is because she was judging with her eyes and thinking that this guy was some kind of low-life scumbag because he doesn't have any of the trappings of wealth on him at all, and the beat-up truck that he drives is kind of a joke. The guy was wealthy beyond belief, right? That's a smart way to live, by the way. Yeah, smart way to live. You know, the people who have to wear their wealth on their person to telegraph to everybody how rich they are, nine times out of 10, they're not wealthy at all. They're just putting on airs. They're in major debt. If the person who has to wear the latest Hermes and the, those Gucci and Versace and stuff like that, the really, really wealthy don't wear that stuff because they don't need to. They don't have anything to prove. So the person who says that, Lord, I need you to buy me a Mercedes Benz. No, you really don't need this. That actually probably hurts you. So James here notes that God can say no to your requests. You ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly 
to spend it on your, on your passions. And watch this. You adulterous people. Adulterous? You're saying we're sexually immoral? You're spiritually immoral, and spiritual immorality is the same as sexual immorality in the eyes of God, right? Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Zing! Well, that go, there, there goes the entire seeker-driven movement in one sentence. It's even a question. It's an interrogative, st interrogative statement. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. But, 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 aren't there exceptions? No. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The world is all about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, power, and things like this, right? What is Christ about? Selflessness, sacrifice, true love, peace, grace, mercy. Do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says, He, God, yearns jealously over the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us, but He gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh-oh. <laughs> he opposes the proud. All right. Well, this is fun. We should leave now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like how quiet it gets. Because here's the thing. We all know exactly what he's talking about. Has anything changed in 2,000 years? No. The names have changed, but it's the same sins that constantly manifest over and over and over and over and over again in societies. Predictably so. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. No, it does not say, command Satan to leave your region. Okay? In the New Apostolic Reformation, this is this bizarre belief that somehow... What you're supposed to do is kind of figure out, get, you know, through deliverance ministries, get the demons to tell you the names of like their superior demons over them and so that you can get their names and then you can cast them out of your region. Okay, I kid you not, that's crazy stuff going on. When C. Peter Wagner was alive, he claimed, I, in public, he claimed that the emperor of Japan had sexual relations with a, a, a female demon. And that that was the reason why he, was, he had power over, the, 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 over Japan. He said that out loud. I've, I could point you to the video. And it's like crazy kind of stuff like this. It's like, what? Okay, so are we fighting the devil? Yes. What do you do to fight the devil? Resist the devil. And though there is a cross-reference to this text, we are to resist the devil firm in our what? Faith. And he will what from you? Okay, y'all seen Mighty Python's The Holy Grail? Okay, remember the rabbit? Okay, run away, run away, run away. So there you are, you're the rabbit. Okay, and you resist the devil in your faith, and the devil comes up, it's like, ah, sharp pointy teeth, right? And they run away, run away, run away. That's the devil will flee from you. It doesn't say anything about commanding the devil to leave the region. You know, this nonsense stuff by it. <laughs> Daniel says the Catholic demon slayers are called the U.S. Grace Force. Oh, please tell me that's, that's please let that be satire. Please let that be satire. That's the wimpiest name ever. I'm part of the Grace Force. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this is this loony. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good night. Let me read uh, 1 Peter 5. Be sober minded. This is 1 Peter 5 8. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion, uh, like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And that, this is absolutely true. But let me pull up the rest of the text. Hang on a second here. 1 Peter 5. 
Oh, hang on, I'm going to end up doing this in Greek if I don't do this right. Hang on a second here. 1 Peter 5. Okay. Now I made it smaller. Oh, that's worse. Sorry, old eyes. Okay. So watch. In fact, let me come back to the ESV on this. And I got to do this all over again. Here we go. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion seeking someone to roar. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So, this is all common. This, the suffering that we're going through. Uh, had, oh, boy. Had, had, you guys ever heard of that guy by the name of Klaus Schwab? Holy <laughs> guacamole. There's some pretty wicked, evil stuff coming down the pike from that guy. Um, I just saw a TED talk from 10 years ago from one of his top advisors, and the guy legitimately claims there's no such thing as human rights. Get in the pot, eat the bugs. Holy smokes. Okay, I'm just saying. So, you know, <laughs> what do we do as Christians? We resist them, right? Okay, resist the devil. He will flee from you. Okay. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. I've never heard Joel Osteen preach on this text. Um, although this would be like one of those ones to pitch to, what's David his face? Lovey. David Lovey. <laughs> <laughs> if, you ha- if you didn't see the, the prophecy bingo that we did with David Lovey, it's, we call it cessationist prophecy bingo because David Lovey was one of the uh, big guys on the, uh, on the cessationist documentary. And, and he, oh, hilarious. He has this special gift. He can take any text and, and actually, in the voice of Joel Osteen, preach it like Joel Osteen would. And so we tried to stump him by giving him some pretty tough texts, like, you know, Judas went and hung himself, go thou and do likewise, you know, kind of stuff. And he was, he was able to turn that into a prosperity text. I kid you not. But, you know, he, he's, he's messed up my ability to use that statement now. I've never, heard, I've never heard Joel Osteen say, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to glooming. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And what? He, he will exalt you. If you're living for the, the accolades of human beings, and believe me, it doesn't even have to be a large group of people. It could be like seeking the accolades of just several special people in your life. Okay? And that need for that ends up creating a real problem in your character. Instead, listen, humble yourselves before the Lord. He'll exalt you. God sees what you're doing. He knows what you're doing. He will exalt you at the proper time. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, this kind of gets at a bigger understanding of the Eighth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And I think this is where James is really going here. He's talking about speaking evil against one another. Luther, I think, in the large catechism, really nails this down in a way that is, is I think, spot-on accurate. And the way Luther addresses this is that just because you have seen a sin committed doesn't give you the right to judge the sin. So, for example, okay, you, you saw your neighbor and you, you saw that they were doing something wrong. Okay? So what did you do about it? You went to Facebook and you let everybody in the, na- in the neighborhood know what was going on because you saw what that person did. You, put a, you made their name famous on social media, right? That's not how this is supposed to go. So if you see your neighbor doing something wrong, you know what you do? You alert the proper authorities. Okay? And the proper authorities then get involved. And then if there's enough evidence to actually bring a charge, they bring a charge. And then the charge is brought before a court. And then the court is, decides, based upon the evidence, whether or not that person was really doing something wrong. And the only person who has the authority in that sense to, to, to take someone's reputation away is, um, is the judge who can say, yes, you're guilty, or no, you're not guilty. But we, we behave evilly when, evilly? Yeah, we, we behave in an evil manner when we become the judge rather than let the judge be the judge. 
right? Now, where this doesn't apply is when it comes to like false teachers, okay? Scripture actually legitimately holds those people into a different category because pastors are to rebuke those who teach contrary to sound doctrine and were to expose the, the work of, of darkness. That's, this is what we're supposed to do. So it's not evil to say this person is teaching false doctrine and that's always what the church has done. But when it comes to our neighbors, you don't speak evil about one another, especially each other. Stephen, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Or, or are you just testifying? No. <laughs> another, another way that's, I think, misused is um, they use it as a, a means to say you shouldn't correct your, your brother or sister um, in a loving way. Right. But for, for sinning. Yeah, I, I, would, I would actually make, <laughs> I'm going to push back on you just a little bit. We do need to correct, but we live in a day where uh, people who speak the truth and actually call out false doctrine, we get tone policed, okay? <laughs> it, I wasn't even talking about false doctrine necessarily, okay. just any kind of. Right. You see your brother or sister sitting in some way. Yeah, go, go to them privately. Right. 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 So, privately. yeah, exactly. But when it comes to public preaching and teaching, that's a different story. And let me, yeah. let me show you the text. Uh, Paul talking about the, uh, the requirements of a man fulfilling to be in the pastoral office. He says, he says this to Titus in Titus 1. This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, husband of one wife. Uh, actually, one, a one woman man here. That, that, so if like a pastor's wife um, you know, dies or leaves him because she committed adultery, that he's, he's free to remarry. That's because this is talking about the sexual standards of, of the pastoral office. And his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, which, is, by the way, does not apply to adult children if an adult child leaves the faith. Um, that's a, that's a d- whole other thing. That, that pastor has nothing to do with that. That's, that's the, the decision of the, of, the, of the grown child. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to what? Rebuke those who contradict it. And rebuke is a harsh word. Now, if you, you want to get a flavor for what this looks like, he says there are many who are insubordinate, insubordinate to Christ. They are empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, well, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Note the sarcasm here, okay? Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Right? So the idea here is is that a false teacher gets a sharp rebuke and a public one at that. And then note the sarcasm that Paul uses. You'll note that Paul uses very strong language against against the Judaizers. Like in Philippians 3, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Uh, in the book of Galatians, boy, boy, hang on to, hang on to your hats on this one. Um, <clears throat> look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify to every man who accepts circumcision, he's obligated to keep the whole law. Um, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. The strong, strong words. Um, and then he goes on to basically say that those who are the circumcision crowds, he wishes they would just cut the whole thing off. Okay? They, they, they didn't cut enough. So you'll note that when it comes to false teachers, they're, they're, they get strong rebukes, they get really strong rebukes, and they don't get treated with any, in a form that would lend them credibility. Um, and he, here's where I think a little bit of an excursus would be helpful. And that is, is that, um, have you guys heard me make the claim that um, the, the Lutherans invented memes? Okay. Okay, hang on a second here. I, 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 I'm open to correction on this, by the way. Okay. But I believe that Lutherans invented memes. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Lutheran woodcut. 
Um, okay, here we go. Okay, so this particular image right over here <laughs> is a woodcut commissioned by Martin Luther. I kid you not. Okay, and it, it depicts the Pope. The Pope is right there. You can see his, his Pope hat. And he's issuing some kind of a papal decree or something like that. And two peasants have dropped their pants and are, um, well, passing gas in his general direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Luther commissioned this. Okay, this is the days before Photoshop. Okay. <laughs> Photoshop uh, 0 0.1 was using woodcuts. So, so you'll note that within the Lutheran tradition, there are particular rebukes and things that are done in a way that it, uh, just don't really fly in polite company. But there's, a, there's an actual method to the madness here. Now, let me explain it to you. Um, the Pope, um, how many biblical texts tell us about the office of the Pope what his powers are, and what are the qualifications for the man holding the office, and what are his duties according to the office of the papacy. How many? Zero. Absolutely zero. Which means what? If this, that, this is the office that is the head of the church, right? The Roman Catholic Church. If that's not an office established by God, who established this? Man. And this is the reason why the Lutheran confessions refer to the office itself. The office of the papacy is the office of the Antichrist because Christ is the head of the church, not the Pope. And so Luther reserved his strongest, most sarcastic and crassest you know, uh, you know, rebukes of the papacy you know, for the papacy because of the fact that we can't as Christians recognize that office. It, in fact, the office has to be torn down. And the office holder who believes all of the press regarding what the office of the papacy is supposed to stand for, that person is super deceived and actually doing the work of the devil. So it's like prophecy bingo. We're doing that to tear down false prophecies. Exactly. It, it, that's exactly what prophecy bingo is, is all about. It's to basically say, we're going to show you we cannot take these prophets literally or can take them seriously because they are not prophets. These are not prophecies. And if you guys saw my response to Catherine Crick, uh, but before the end of the year, Catherine Crick, who claims she's an apostle, she issued a prophecy claiming that all the older men, in, all the older leaders within the Christian church had to acknowledge the younger leaders like herself, and pass the batons to her. So I, I had a conversation with uh, Stephen Elliott at the time and said, uh, you'll be good, you should be surprised to hear that I will not be passing my baton on to Catherine Crick. But she, she doubled down on this prophecy. She tripled down on this prophecy, issued a written version of this prophecy that I then reacted to where I had a, a voice read out her prophecy in kind of a screechy voice, and, um, and where she says, if you do not pass the baton, then God is going to take it from you. Thus saith the apostle Catherine Crick. My response to her was, <laughs> right? Which is the correct response. Because the woman has no office. She is not an apostle. She is not a prophet. And to even like say, well, let me weigh these words and consider them with a, with a prayer, prayerful heart as if somehow there's any truth in them at all. It's obvious because by this woman's presence within the visible church, teaching contra contrary in public in the church to the commands of Christ, I don't have to take her seriously. She's not recognized. And so sometimes the correct response to false teaching or false prophecy or a false prophet or a false apostle is, <laughs> right? That's the right response. I, I, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, I get the feeling like, like I, I'm going to probably need this little snippet of my teaching for a video, a standalone, to, just so, because there are more and more people are, don't you think that that's wrong? How dare you? How you call yourself a pastor? And you would do <laughs> to Catherine Crick? <laughs> you know. 
It's like, yes, of course. Okay? That is the correct response for people who are high on their own flatulence. That's the way this goes. They need to be torn down because they do not hold a valid office. And they're not truly speaking for God while claiming to hold an office that is that and demand allegiance to them. Crazy stuff. So I have to leave here. We'll pick up the rest of this next week. This is still an excursus on our study of Ezekiel, but uh, I think thought this was an important one. All right, peace to you. Yes. Yeah, just one question. Uh, so, do they see this as a, an adding to scripture or just an interpretation of scripture? Or? Who? Uh, these prophetic. Oh, these people who act. So they will always say this. Well, we don't consider this to be an addition to scripture. No, we don't listen to it. But it's a fresh word from the Lord, and you're you bound to obey it. So, all right. All right. Peace to you, brothers and sisters. Lord willing, we will see you next time.